Praise the Lord. Good to see you this evening. Let's stand together, please, and let's begin by singing, This is the day that the Lord hath made. This is the day.
sing, I am so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm so glad. Numbers chapter 11. 
So turn with me, please, to Numbers chapter 11. Recently used this section of scripture for something, <clears throat> and uh, so it may seem familiar to you. But in Numbers chapter 11, I'll start reading at verse 14. Numbers 11 and 14. Moses is speaking here, and he says in verse 14, I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee, and I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and I will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. You can put a marker there, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Our second example is in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, where I'll start reading at verse 1. Acts 6. Verse 1. <clears throat> and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Two different examples, uh, two completely um, different situations, yet um, both similar in need and similar in the solution for the particular need. This evening I want to spend just a few minutes uh, focusing on something we've heard a great deal of lately because it's so very, very critical and especially as the enemy uh, continues to try and pull God's people apart. We've heard much lately about the importance of unity within the church. Um, and I'm sure you would agree with me, uh, both Pastor John and I, we've been speaking and sharing and highlighting the importance of unity, the uh, importance of there being no division, no schism uh, in the church. Um, and so as such, you know, we remember some verses. Again, you don't need to turn to these. You know, we've seen them and heard them lately. But in uh, Philippians, one that I like, in chapter 2 and verse 2, uh, actually I'll start reading at verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Another verse that speaks of unity is, uh, and actually uses that particular term, we know is in Psalm 133. That's verse 1. It says, Behold, 
how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So we acknowledge, because the Bible tells us so, that unity is really important. But I wanted to spend a moment to provide a little bit of an example and to just look at why it's so important. Now, for some, the obvious, the answer is obvious. And, and sometimes I, um, I worry, you know, that uh, we can speak about the obvious and people will just fall asleep. But I think it's critical that we don't assume anything. Uh, we don't want people to sort of go off on different tracks and on different trails all on their own. That's not unity. Unity serves a purpose. It's not just the fact that God wants us to be together. It's not just the fact that God wants us to be like-minded, as the scripture says. But there's a purpose to having unity. There's a purpose to uh, dwelling together in that unity, as it says there in Psalm. And we see an indication of that in the two examples that we started off with this evening. Take the clothes pin, if you would. This is a really simple little example. And uh, some of you may not even notice a great, great difference. When I pick up a clothes pin, I tend to put it between my thumb and then the fingers that sort of come next to that, index finger, pointer, etc. And I find it very easy to, you know, squeeze the clothes pin. I have no difficulty with that. And, you know, you can do the same. You hopefully have no difficulty opening and closing the clothes pin. You don't even have to think about it, okay? If I told you to try and do that with just one finger, let's say just your thumb, your first big challenge is going to be trying to pick up the clothespin. Okay, so if I put the clothespin down and I try and pick it up with my thumb, you know, I might try and hook it a little bit, but even if I do that, I'm going to be pressing it against the other finger, so that, that, that's not so easy to do. And you may be able to do it, you know, you may be special, and that's a good thing. Um, but my point there is that doing anything with the clothespin other than perhaps knocking it around with only one finger or one appendage is much, much, much more difficult. We haven't changed the clothespin at all. We've just suddenly changed the number of appendages or how we are going about using the clothespin. Another way to consider this is I often use two fingers just out of habit or I guess one supporting the other when I do this. Um, when Stephanie was recovering from her uh, broken wrist, one of the uh, exercises that were given to her by the therapist was a clothespin. She came home and she said, here's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to take the clothespin, use my thumb, use my baby finger, and then squeeze the clothespin. Okay. Now the first few times I did this, the clothespin went shooting away. You know, I, I, I just I couldn't quite figure out how to do it. But and you got to be careful that you don't take this other finger and that it doesn't help. Right? Just using the two, your thumb and your baby finger, I can do that no problem really. Oops, Stephanie just went flying. Um, to do it in my with my left hand, now is somewhat more difficult. I can do it. Okay, and it's not the point of whether you can do this or not. What I'm just trying to demonstrate is that when we do something as simple as this, it's more than one. We use two. Sometimes we use three. If you wanted to use three fingers plus your thumb, it becomes even easier to do. Okay? The more um, force, power, you have on either side of the clothespin, obviously the easier it becomes. And if you have weaker baby fingers, or as Stephanie was trying to work on her muscles to get them stronger, it's a pretty good exercise. Uh, it helps with your grip, I suppose. And you can sit down and you can listen to the radio or watch television or whatever it happens to be. And you don't need a fancy piece of equipment, you just need a clothespin. All right? But 
Regardless of that, to open and close the closed plane successfully requires more than one. It's two, at the very least, working together. And sometimes if one of the members is weak, taking another finger on top of that baby finger, and suddenly that becomes just about as easy as when I was doing it this way. Okay? My title for the message is that we are stronger together. That as a family, and that term itself signifies more than one. I know the world might want to change it. Somebody out there might say, well, I'm a family. I'm just one person, but I'm a family. Well, in truth, you're not. And, and that's not, I'm not trying to put anybody down by saying that. Um, you know, it's just like I can't say I'm an astronaut. I might wish I were an astronaut, but I'm not an astronaut, so face the reality. You know, Roger, you're not an astronaut. Okay, I'm not a surgeon. There are a lot of things that I'm not, and that's not to put myself down or you down. It's just a statement of reality. So, to be one person and to be a family, sorry, I don't think that's possible. However, to be more than one person, then you can become a family. And as you have more people working in unity, the importance, one of the reasons unity is so critical, is that it allows the entire body to be stronger. It also allows the entire body to do things that are not possible for just one member to do. So when I ask you, you know, just take your thumb and try and, you know, open and close, you know, now if you put it against something, you can be creative, etc. You know, but to lift it up and to try and do it with just your thumb, as amazing as your thumb might be, is not that great of an exercise. Hard to do. And in the body of Christ, really the message this evening is that in order for us to actually do what God wants us to do, we need to maintain the unity, the like-mindedness, the fellowship together, because that makes us stronger. And when we are stronger, we are able to do more for the Lord and for His kingdom. You're not, and I'm not, a silo all by myself. We're not an isolated powerhouse all by ourselves. You know, sometimes we might think we can do everything, and we look at the scripture. Moses was a powerful man of God. Moses was chosen of God. But it came a point when Moses said, we can do more and we'll be in better shape, obviously I'm paraphrasing now, if we have more than one member of the body taking care of the business. And so Moses, you know, if you look at the, what I read there, um, it's quite interesting, really. Um, if I can find it again here, quickly. It's interesting because Moses is very distraught. That's my interpretation. Because in verse 15, if you'll recall what I read, he says to God, and if thou deal thus with me, and I think what he means there is if you don't get me some help, because in the previous verse, he said, it's too heavy for me. It's too much for me. I'm just a thumb. I'm just one by myself. And Moses is so adamant about this that he says to the Lord, and if thou deal thus with me, Kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight. In other words, if you're not going to get me any more help, if you can't provide, it, provide at least a baby finger so that we can do this job more efficiently, which is for God's honor and glory, if you're not going to do this, then just kill me right now and put me out of my misery. That's Moses. That's what he said. Right? He said, I pray thee out of hand if I have found favor in thy sight. In other words, you know, if, if you really love me, 
Kill me if you're not going to get me any more help. Because I can't do this alone. It's just too much for me. God hears his cry. And we can talk a lot about, you know, the process that takes place. But the point that I want to drive home here is that, you know, it tells me in verse 17, at the end of that verse, And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Not thyself alone. You see, it's important for us as a family of God that we recognize God does not wish you or me to carry the entire burden alone. And there are all kinds of burdens. We have burdens in our families. We have situations that we're dealing with. And, you, and you've heard me say before, and I will repeat it again because it's really heavy on my heart. That I worry and I am upset and I think we are just not doing what God wants us to do if we don't at least share to some level. If we're worried about gossip, if we're worried about what people will say, then Satan is really in a place where he has robbed us of the power of God and of being a family working together. And scripture shows me, and I'm sharing with you from Moses this example, where it wasn't an attack on Moses. It wasn't that people could, would say, Moses, you're a has-been. Moses, you must be done, washed up, you know, that you can't do this by yourself. No. It was good for Moses. It was good for the family of God. And ultimately, it was good for God's kingdom that now there were people working together in unity, sharing their strength to do what God wanted them to do. It was a blessing. It wasn't a slight or a negative thing. It was a blessing. Turn where we were in Acts. And let's see the very same thing. A different situation, a different time, but the same thing is taking place. It tells me here in Acts chapter 6 where we were, in those days, verse 1, when the number of the disciples was multiplied. So the church was growing. Praise the Lord. Hello? Mm -hmm. That's a blessing, right? The church was growing. But as the church grew, there were some administrative things that needed to be adjusted. There were some changes that needed to take place because it was no longer possible for the original 12 disciples to be everywhere, to be doing everything, when the church was growing at the speed that it was growing. And so now they show us and the Bible uses a pretty natural example, right? There was strife in the church. There, was, there were two groups, the Grecians and the Hebrew people. And this is the fault, I think, of, a, of the flesh. They forgot that they were all the family of God, right? And they were starting to do, see, it bothers me a lot. Okay, this is just a personal thing. I don't like it when they refer to, oh, I'm a German-Canadian. And I'm a French Canadian. And I'm a whatever Canadian. Guess what? As far as I'm concerned, we should all be Canadians. Period. Just my opinion. Because all of those little divisions, and I come from German background, and I'm proud of my heritage. But my relatives decided to come to Canada. They became Canadians. Period. But when you start dividing in all those little groups, you start to have problems. And they were having those problems in scriptural times, right? You had the Grecian Christians, and you had the Hebrew Christians, and they were looking at each other, and there was jealousy, and there was, you know, they, they started to talk about it was not fair. You're being treated 
our widows aren't being treated as good as your widows. And there weren't this infighting was stuck. That was not unity. So to reestablish the unity, there needed to be help given. The 12 disciples just couldn't do it anymore on their own. Not a blotch against them. Not to say, oh, they must have been so disorganized or they were getting lazy. No, it wasn't about that at all. It was about the fact the church was growing. The job was getting more complicated. It wasn't something that just the thumb could do anymore. And so, by the Spirit of the Lord, the twelve decide that they are going to call, notice what it says, they call together in verse 2, the multitude of the disciples. There were lots of disciples. They called them all together, right? And they said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, they're not belittling the serving of tables. And you can't take that scripture and say, oh, obviously the word was more important than the tables. That's not what the disciples were saying. The disciples were saying, there are so many jobs, so many tasks, and we feel God has led us to the task of the word. But the tables are important too. And I'm, I see that confirmed in the word of God because one of the seven chosen was Stephen. You see that, right? And it describes Stephen as somebody full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. So that, you know, this was not just something that anybody could do. It still had to be a man or a woman of God. A gift. It was a gift. And a matter of fact, it tells us down in verse 8, and that's why I read all the way down to verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. He's one of the seven who was put in charge of the tables or the widows or the ministration, the sharing of the resources to those in need. But see, God was using him mightily in all kinds of different ways. So this wasn't, oh, well, anybody can do that. Or that can be somebody who's not important to do that. That's not the message here. The message is that the disciples needed more fingers. The disciples needed more help. And because of the unity of the body, there were people there that I believe by the Holy Spirit were set apart and given the task of helping in a like-minded way, in a way that brought glory to the entire body and ultimately, of course, to Christ. See, being alone, and yes, we always have the Lord with us. God understands that, and I'm not taking that away. But God designed it that there should be two or three. God designed it that there should be a family. God put it that there needed to be a church, a unit, a group of people that could depend on one another, that could work together, that could be trusted to do what they were being asked to do. See, I believe that after the twelve disciples said to the seven, Here's your job. God has given you this task. And it was important because it helped to provide unity to the church. I believe after that, perhaps once in a while, one of the twelve would check in. How are things going? But you see, that was now no longer a primary concern for the twelve. Which also means that they could now give wholehearted effort to the task that God had given them. And that in turn also strengthens the entire body. Turn with me in closing to Ecclesiastes. I don't read, well I read, but I don't often refer to Ecclesiastes. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it's an interesting section of Scripture. 
And it's speaking here about unity, and it's speaking about how more than one is better. And I want you to consider this and pray about this, because it means that with the Lord and you, you need never be alone. You should be able to call upon a brother, a sister, pray about, Lord, lay this task on somebody else's heart so we can do this together. So that the work is shared. And Ecclesiastes tells us why this is important. Starting in chapter 4, at verse 9. Ecclesiastes 4 and 9. Right off the bat it says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, Two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Some practical examples that have a spiritual application, but suggesting very strongly that it's better to do things with more than one. And I could also refer to, and I'm not going to, but I'll mention, we also see, do we not, that the disciples, Jesus sent them out two by two. He didn't send them out by themselves. He sent them out together so that they could support one another, so they could do, as it says here in Ecclesiastes, if one falls, one is weary, then chances are the other is there to help. And, you know, I want you to consider that and thank God for the family of God. Thank God for your brother and for your sister. And perhaps we need to call upon our brothers and sisters just a little bit more. Just a little bit more to request perhaps prayer. Or to request a physical help. You know, you're doing something, you could use a hand. We should be calling, I think, this is just me, but I think we should call upon the family of God much before we call upon the world to help us out. But we don't always do that. And it's something that I have to pray about. Absolutely. I like to think I can do things by myself. I do. I confess that before you, but I'm also going to say that's not right. And actually, as I got a little older, and particularly in my role as a principal, I suddenly discovered that yes, I could work 16 hours a day or 17 hours a day and Stephanie would attest. I would leave in the morning, I'd come home to eat, I'd eat and then I'd leave again. My children would attest to that. That was not the best thing in the world to do. And then I would work at school until 11.30 at night, until just before the alarm was going to go off. And then I would drive home. And I'd get home, you know, between you know, quarter to 12 or 12 o'clock go to sleep, be awake again at 6 in the morning, and off we go for another day. Why? Because I had to do it all by myself. Foolish. Foolish. And really, in the end, the job that I was doing wasn't as good as if I was asking other people to help me. And so, I invite you to reflect on that. Yes, we can pray by ourselves, but communal prayer, calling on a brother, calling on a sister, making a prayer request, and we always ask, can we share that with the body? And our prayer, of course, is always that you would say yes, because it's good for the body to pray one for another, and we should care one for another. And so when we didn't see Sister Mary this morning, and I confess I didn't click into that right away, but when I did, I wondered, okay, and it 
It's not because I want to gossip. It's because I care. Where are, what's Sister Mary? And I asked Brother Mary, and he told me. Okay, and I know others spoke to him as well, which is a good thing. When Sister Webster wasn't here this morning, did, was anybody concerned? Did anybody check? I hope you did. It would have been a good thing, right? So that's our job as a body, but now I'm also going to say, and this might make you a little bit more uncomfortable, that if you're not feeling well, it would also do you well to let the body know. So I'll pick on my daughter, right, who sent us a text message that she wasn't feeling well, but we didn't see that until after church, right? But the point is, if I'm not well, and I'm not going to be there, there's nothing wrong with letting somebody in the church know so that they can let the pastors know so that we can pray together because there's strength in being together. There's unity if we're together. And one of the reasons for unity is for strength so that God's work can go forth in a much, much better fashion. Stand with me, please. I'm going to close. I've given you much to think about, perhaps. The Lord has given you some things to think about. And you can just examine yourself. There's no uh, criticism coming from me directly to you. I'm speaking in general terms, and I'm certainly talking to myself. And I have to learn a little bit more to ask for that help. You know, sometimes I'm foolish. i give you one more foolish example. Sometimes I order things from the store. And then I say to Stephanie, we need to buy a truck. We need a pickup truck. I can't get this 4x8 piece of wood in my car. And they won't cut it for me. And so what I should maybe do, and you don't have to say yes or, you know, I should maybe phone Lois or Pastor John and say, but, you know, could I come out and borrow your truck for like half an hour? And they might say no. That's up to them, perfectly up to them, right? But there's no harm in asking, because when I don't do that, I pay $60 to have it delivered. And some people say, well, you, you got the money, don't worry about it. Well, okay, I suppose that's true too. I could do that. But my point is, and that's just a natural example, right? Sometimes I don't ask, which is foolish. And if I'm not asking about natural things, then maybe I'm also not asking like I should for help with spiritual things. And that's even more foolish. Now, I'll leave you with that as we close. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord God, you're always working on me. Always. And you have a tendency to point out the places where I'm weak and at times... I find that uncomfortable and I don't always enjoy that. But in the end, I have to acknowledge that's for my good. That's for the best. That's for my growing and for my learning. And I always know, Lord, that you're doing that because you love me. It's not to point out how foolish I've been or how silly I've been or some other thing. But Lord, it is so that I can learn to trust you and to call upon my brothers and my sisters, as I see in the scripture, Lord, that you wanted the body to help one another, that there was strength as the body helped one another, using their unity to advance the kingdom of God. And so I ask your Lord Jesus that in the week that's coming, the weeks that are coming, help me to consider my ways. Help me to look at, is there something that I can ask for help? Is there a place where brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, somebody could help me? Do I need some prayer? And would it be good to know that a brother or sister are praying for my healing, for my strengthening, for my deliverance, whatever it happens to be. And I don't have to provide all kinds of details if I am worried about that. Lord, open my eyes to see 
the unity that is there and to use it for your honor and for your glory. So Lord, we have prayer requests tonight. And perhaps there are others that are unspoken or spoken. But Father, help us not to judge and not to be critical and not to surmise as to why this is or why that is. But Lord God, to bring these things before you truly in prayer. To lay them at the altar. And to say, Lord Jesus, on behalf of my brother, my sister, the church, I'm bringing my petition. We're bringing this request. We're asking you to have your way. And that's what I'm asking tonight, Lord. I'm asking you, Jesus, have your way with me. Have your way with us. Lead us and guide us together on the path that you have chosen. And may we, dear God, know that if I fall, or a brother falls, that if we're working together with more than one, there will be somebody there to lift me up. There will be somebody there to encourage me on my low day. And so, dear God, set me free from things that would bind, and set us free from Satan, who would have us be a little bit closed-mouthed, and a little bit too private at times, I think. Because, Lord, let us see the strength of the body in action. That's my prayer. Let us see the strength of the body in action. Bless us. Be with us. Help us to remember the prayer requests I ask in Jesus' name.